Welcome to the flower garden videogram. You know, there's few things more relaxing than working amongst flowers, but to get it right, you've got to follow a few basic rules. And that's what we hope to show you. After that, you're on your own. It's up to you, your own design. And there'll be something on bedding plants, something on roses, something on patio gardening, and then reclaiming a derelict shrub border and flower border. Sounds like a lot of work. But you know, when you get results, the effort's well worthwhile. Every year there's the same problem. When has the spring bedding gone so far out of flower that you can afford to lift it? Or when is the spring summer bedding so far advanced that it's got to go out? And I've reached that stage this year. But I feel that the tulips, the polyanthus, and the violas that have been in flower with the mild winter from the middle of February right through until the third week of May have given me value for money, but you don't have to throw them away. This is a mistake that so many people make. They think that once you've had the flowers off tulips, that's it. Once you've seen polyanthus into bloom, then you've had the best of them. No, you can lift them, and if you've got a spare bit of ground round the back, heal them in there, let them ripen up. Divide your polyanthus, let them grow into big plants for next year. Because polyanthus, wallflowers, winter violas, the best of all winter bedding. Because in a garden, you know, the, if you've got a small garden, you plant it up with shrubs, the change in interest is purely in breadth and height. And inevitably, no matter how keen you are on gardening, you're going to get bored with it. So you change the the presence of a garden by changing your bedding schemes. One year in summer you have an anti rhinum year, you have a nasty year. And I'm taking my coat off because I'm going to work, believe it or not. And that's interesting, the Shirley poppy there is a hangover from the previous garden design and it would of course flower. But because I want to bed things out, it's got to come out. And the lawn edge, well, the lawn is new sown. And that edge hasn't set yet. The grass roots haven't gone in enough to allow me to edge it off to a firm edge. So I'm planting right up to it, and I'll do the edging once the grass has bound the soil together. The daffodil is another incumden, as we say, another hangover. It could be left in, of course, but I want it out of the way because daffodils are going to be in the informal shrub border. And the tulips, don't make them produce seed. I want all that to go down into the bulb so I get a good big flowering bulb for next year. But it's hard work now. Get them out and get the other stuff in. The violas, it almost seems a crime to pull them out, but what I'm going to do with them, they've got powerful roots, they're still in full bloom, but I'm going to plant them in moist soil in a shady position, round in the spare ground, cut them hard back, right to the bone, as we say in gardening terms. Now, they will grow young shoots, which will make perfect cuttings by the middle of July. I'll take the cuttings, put them in a frame, and I've got a crop of violas for next year. So treat those very gently. You can't go on crop, crop, crop. 
taking all out of the ground and putting nothing back in. So the thing that you've got to do is put in a little supplementary feed and peat mixed with a, a fertilizer like fish meal or the John in his base will just put enough organic matter and feed into the soil to keep your bedding plants going. So clean it, feed it, plant it. Simple as that. And the tulips and the things that I dug up out of the front garden are well worth preserving. There's a bulb that, if I look after it, will build up and give me not as big a flower, but certainly a, a flower that'll be worth looking at next spring. And all gardens, especially gardens of this capacity, need a reserve border, a growing on bed where you put the things that you're going to save or where you raise new plants so that continually you're embellishing the garden. You're providing it with new material because a garden is a place that's continually evolving. If it's the same, it's not interesting. You want new things, exciting things, things that will add interest and keep your interest right through the year. And what I'm doing is ripening these bulbs up, forcing the nutrient that these leaves will continue to manufacture down in so the bulbs get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the bigger the bulb, the better quality flower. You do get disease in tulips, of course you do, but a dusting of captan will take care of that. A clean garden doesn't carry disease. If you're careful, you can keep it disease free. Then all you do is rub the soil back in. When the tops have died down, I lift them. And tulips are best planted, what, in late October, whenever the soil's right. They don't want to be in the ground too early because they get up too early and get nipped by the frost. There's a time and a season for everything in the gardening world. And you may think that a season is backward, that you're late with things, but nature has a way of letting the whole business catch up with itself. Now those are young plants, strong, healthy young plants, but some of them are in twos and can be divided. So I get two for the price of one. I lay them in just like the tulips. And I'm hurrying a little bit because I tend to be a bit like an anxious father when plants are wilting in the sun. They want to be in the ground. It's amazing how quickly they do dehydrate in the sunshine. Now, they seem to be jammed in there, but each one has about three inches, four inches of space. And I'll leave them there until I want to plant up the spring bedding. Firm the soil well round them, get your feet in. And I reckon that soil should be in good enough condition to support pelagoniums or geraniums if you want to be popular, and tagetes because they complement each other with the foliage and they enjoy pretty much the same condition. And it's a small bed, so you don't want anything that gets too tall, otherwise your proportions are all gone. I find approximately the center of the bed and use the pelagoniums as an impact point, something to give emphasis to the general planting. And that one certainly is big enough to leave its mother. The root system's very well developed, so there's no check as they've been properly hardened off in the frames, and we shouldn't really get a vast lot of frost now. I oh sincerely hope we don't, not at the end of May, because the bedding plants really are ready for going out. That's the best way to knock them out, a good hefty thump on the bottom of the pot. And put them in about, oh, 10 inches to a foot apart, 
and don't pussyfoot around when you're firming them in. They want to be firm, all the weight on the fingers. So the soil's pressed about the root. And then they're not prey to every stray cat or wandering dog that comes along. That one didn't come out so good. The roots were through the holes at the bottom of the pot and it's pulled a little, but soil conditions are so good that I don't think there'll be any problem. Firm them well in and keep them more or less symmetrical and they will fill right in and continue to flower right through the summer. One in the center. Completes the process. And they will grow until they're a solid mass of foliage and flower. And the thing with both the pelagoniums and the tagetes is you don't want a soil that's too rich. Otherwise you get all leaf growth and no flower. And the tagetes grow about six, eight inches high, so they'll go in six inches apart, which will make a solid carpet of color. They've got beautiful leaves and they have yellow flowers, brilliant yellow flowers, a glorious color with no hint of acid lemon in it at all. So space them about six, eight inches apart. This is one of the virtues, of course, of growing your own plants. You can be a, a little more reckless, a little more generous with them to get a quick effect. So eventually we want a solid carpet of flower. And look at the complement of foliage there. The pelagonium and the tagetes, the delicate filigree of the tagetes, the rather ponderous elegance of the pelagonium. And as with the pelagoniums, firm them well in to ensure that there's the perfect match between soil and plant root. And there's an interesting thing with the tagetes because as well as being beautiful, they are useful. When you're continuously on an allotment growing potatoes, you do on occasions get a buildup of potato root eelworm. And the only way to get rid of that is to break the rotation. It means leaving potatoes off the land for about five, six years. Well, this is impossible on an allotment. It's one of the crops that you do grow. But if you plant tagetes, it causes the cysts of the potato root eelworm to hatch. But the youngsters that hatch out can't feed on the potato root, so they die of starvation. And that's one way of being able to keep on growing potatoes in your rotation. And don't forget, once they're planted, that they want watering in just to settle them down. And when you're watering like this, turn the rows, the sprinkler on the can, upside down so the water is directed where it wants to be onto the plants with enough force to take the soil down to the roots with it. And usually, judging by the average English summer, the initial watering is all they need because then the rain takes over and that's it. You've got no problem. If you're planting late at night, of course, and there is a threat that the weather's going to turn colder, leave the watering till next morning. Get up early and do it before the sun's on them. Underneath a beech tree, a copper beech, beautiful in itself, but difficult to garden underneath bluebells that even in a suburban garden create an illusion of the countryside and this the pachysandra that eventually will spread into a weed proof carpet but in the meantime a quick flash of color from the bedding begonias mixed colors light pastel shades that'll bring life into the dark corner when the bluebells are finished and these again are a product from the greenhouse saving money and they will tolerate the fairly intense shade but what I did underneath the beech tree and it won't harm the tree 
is just to a spade depth nick round within say two yards of the trunk of the tree with a sharp spade now that cuts the surface roots of the tree and then you put some decent soil a little bit of compost in and you can grow bedding plants like begonias and if i have a sneaking regard above the ordinary for any bedding plant it's the begonia because the fibrous rooted begonia is so good natured so eager to get on with the business of flowering that it doesn't matter whether it's a wet summer whether it's a dank gray summer or a hot dry one provided you've got the humus in the soil to hold the moisture they will flower look at them beautiful foliage so immediately the bluebell color fades i'm producing a completely different pattern completely different leaf shape of ground cover of flower color and they will persist right through the summer and if you're really greedy well not greedy let's call it careful you can select the color forms you like the best you can pot them up take them into the greenhouse or into the windowsill in the living room enjoy the color right into the winter cut the plants hard back and then next year when the young growths come again take them as cuttings and you know precisely what the flower color is going to be i'm putting them casually some widely spaced some close together some scattered poked in behind the pachysandra which is an excellent plant for ground cover in shade as if nature had done the sowing very gently herself across the ground and because the garden isn't particularly large and because I want to spread the interest and the foliage character and the flower character as much as I possibly can I want to grow a lot of different things that's enough just a patch and then I'll sow some hardy annuals in here to take the color later into the season because that's what gardening's all about a year-round interest You know, when anyone asks me what to plant in a garden, and I'm not quite sure what his soil is like, or what the exposure is like, I say roses. Because let's face it, these are the pack horse of gardening. They'll carry a tremendous burden, they'll give you a marvelous return. And when we think about roses, we think about the perfection of the HT. Look at it, jewel polished with drops of rain on it, just to freshen the flower quality. Oh, we think about the Floribundas. Now, these are the carnival plants of the garden. If you put them in, you're going to get a tremendous return of color. You're going to get this blaze, not quite the perfection of flower, but you're going to get the wealth of color that makes the garden a joy to be in in June. Now, there's roses and roses. Anybody can grow roses, but it takes more effort to grow good roses and they're worth the effort it's worth that little bit of extra time that little bit of extra understanding to get this and this now what do you look for i'm going to put that into a vase in the house and it'll last for 10 days but what do you look for in a rose bush you want powerful dark green glossy foliage this sort of foliage has the ability somehow to resist disease. You want strong growth coming from very low down. The one thing I hate is roses lightly pruned that look like crow's nests on telegraph poles. Who wants that? Roses you've got a step ladder to go and look at. You want the growth coming from low down and then your pruning then regenerates that bush every year. Now, the plant can't do this on fresh air. It's making what? Three foot six of growth a year. 
It doesn't do that on gin and kippers. It needs good, solid roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, which means you feed and you look after the soil. Look after the soil, and the tops will look after themselves. I like to get any planting of roses or anything else really done either very early in the autumn or early in the spring. And in the autumn, while the soil's still warm, they've got a chance to root in, to establish before the winter comes round. But before I put anything in there, I want to find out whether the soil needs lime or not. And to me, this is important, that the fact that if your soil's limey, you use a different type of fertilizer than if your soil's acid. And you can't know by looking at it. You've got to test it, and it's a very, very simple business. All you need is two chemicals and a little bit of your own soil, and you take it from two inches down. Don't take it from the top, because the reading is altered by atmosphere, by soil moisture, by so many things. So take a spade and just nick it out a little bit. A sample of the soil that you're going to test. And it must be fairly dry, because if anybody's tried getting in moist soil into a test tube that big, they'll know why it must be dry. Don't touch it with your hands, because the sweat on your hands is acid. And it'll alter the reading, of course. And that's filled it up to the lower mark. And then you top it up with the indicator, the color indicator, which will tell you whether there is lime present or whether your soil is acid enough to require a dressing of lime. And then shake it up using the cork, because again, if your finger touches the soil, it's going to change the reading. Like making a cocktail. And then when it's settled, you have a, a colorant showing at the top. And you compare it with the colorant on the chart. And that is just on the acid side of neutral. That's ideal for roses. This is exactly what I wanted. It needs the merest touch of lime to adjust it. The principles of planting are always the same, whether it's a standard or a bush rose. And if you're paying a pound for a rose, then dig a 30 shilling hole. It's that important to give your roots room to spread out so that each one's got its fair share of space and above all, its fair share of nutriment. And that's what a good standard rose should look like. A good head on it, a proper length of stem, and a root that's big enough to support the bush and if your soil's right, those roots will bush out and get hold very quickly. Now, that's not quite right. You see, that those roots are, are being curled up, are being constricted. So take it out again. Take a bit more. And in addition to making certain that your hole's big enough to take the roots, make sure it's deep enough. And the way to check this is to look for the soil mark on the stem. That little moist mark there shows you what depth the rose was planted in the nursery. So that soil mark is about, when the rose is planted, is about an inch below the soil surface. But I spoil my roses. I plant them in special compost so that the fine root hairs have the best possible chance of survival. And all it is is a mixture of well-rotted manure, peat, and soil. And I add a little bone meal. Now, I know there are people who say, oh, bone meal, it's an expensive way of putting fertilizer in. As far as I'm concerned, it's an organic fertilizer that breaks down slowly and feeds the roots gently. It takes about six months to finally disintegrate. There's no question of burning the roots. You can put bone meal right up against them. Mix that thoroughly into the base of the hole. 
Uh, little attentions to details of what make gardening. This is, you want good roses, you've paid money for them. So, a little bit of peat, not expensive, a little bit of soil and a little bit of well-rotted muck. There's a saying in my part of the world that a shovel full of muck down there is better than a barrel load on top. I could practically get in there myself. Now, those roots sit comfortably in that hole. It has a very long stem, so I put a stake in to hold it. And to make certain that you're not damaging any of the roots, put it in position before you put the soil back. And always the stake goes on the windward side, so instead of blowing onto the stake and rubbing like that, it's blowing away from it with the prevailing wind and the spade. I use my spade for everything, for digging, for planting, and for knocking stakes in. And to me, there's no better bit of equipment. It lets the folks in the house know I'm working. They often think I nip into the garden to avoid the washing up. Well, I do. <laughs> to be honest, yes, I do. To stimulate root action, clip all the roots back a little bit. And as with pruning, when you prune the top of a rose, it stimulates very active growth. And the same thing applies with the roots. That when you tip it like that, you're stimulating the hormone concentration is activated and you get a mass of these very fine root feeding hairs. That's where the plant feeds, just on that root tip there, nowhere else, just right at the area of active growth. So the more of those you get, the quicker your plant is going to grow. It sounds like a very complicated business, but it isn't. It's as simple as sowing seeds. And get in with your hands, work it down amongst the roots, tuck the roots down amongst the soil. And then in with your feet to firm it. Shake it. That's the thing that sifts the soil down so that each fine root hair is properly encased in it. And then firm it again, but not right up to the top. I always leave the last two inches fine and loose so that the rain of winter and the snow and the moisture can percolate down. If you dance about on it, like a ballroom champion, you're going to make it hard. The rain won't be able to get in, and there'll be a big puddle of water there, and your tree's standing in wet. It'll not like it. It won't like it at all. Now, the soil there was just a wee bit acid. So I'm using magnesium limestone, a, a grey sort of limestone, because Roses seem to have a very high magnesium demand. I also include a teaspoonful of Epsom salts in the feeding in the early part of the spring. It puts a shine on the leaf. Don't, whatever you do, A, use fresh manure down near the roots, and B, use lime and fresh manure together. It's a very bad mistake. That should be enough. And then a support. No matter how good your planting is, you've got to have some support. And I use a tie that, as the tree grows, it expands with it, so there's no question of the tree strangling itself. That loop there, that little stop, is the safety factor. That goes between the rows and the stake, and as the tree grows, so the tie slips through and stops the tree st strangling itself. Like that. And then, because there's such a length of stem, put an extra one in. Lower down.
Now there, the gales of winter will not harm that, will not disturb it at all. But just to make assurance double sure, I'm not going to prune it as a proper pruning. I'm going to take just enough of the top weight off to ensure that the plant doesn't suffer excessive wind rock. Head it back just enough. This wood hasn't ripened. You're not really doing any harm at all to the rose. In the spring, I really do believe in boning, as they call it, newly planted roses, to get the top so I can shape it up. Just a little bit, not too much. And there, that's fine for the winter. I can leave it alone, not really worry about it, apart from an inspection now and again to make sure that it's not chafing. And there's more argument about pruning roses than about anything else in gardening. When to do it, how to do it, why to do it. Well, you can prune them in the autumn, but I'm not very keen on that. I think you risk a great deal of damage over the winter. I prefer to do it in spring, and I choose a warm day, because it's not a job you can rush at and keep warm. It's something you've got to look at, to concentrate on, so pick a warm day, and then you can enjoy what you're doing. So first, the first job is to get rid of the growth you don't want, the stuff that is absolutely useless. And you want a good sharp pair of secateurs, and you want a good strong pair of gloves. Now that is a bad shoot. There's dye back there. You can see the, the stain going back into the wood. And if you split that down, you can see the brown, it's actually dead. Now that will continue back until it kills the whole shoot, and you can see what an effect it's having. Those should have been great, powerful growths coming out of there. Instead, the weak, whippy things, good to neither man nor beast. Diseased wood, dead wood, out of the way. Don't ever be tempted to leave it. And you've got two shoots there that are going to grow into each other in the course of next year. So take one out. Now, round the base, always of shoots, there's a cluster of buds. I haven't killed that. There's going to be a great thumping shoot of growth out of there. I've cut it so hard that I'm going to stimulate enormous growth. So there's no question of depressing that growth. I'm going to prune the strong shoot coming from it back to six buds. And make your cuts like that. The bud is there, facing out. Cut it not too close to the bud so you damage it. Not too far away so you leave an area of wood that'll die back, but just close enough and sloping away so it sheds the moisture. You don't want rainwater collecting in that and starting a rot. There's another strong shoot there. Prune that one so there's no question of that bud growing and interfering with this one. So I've got a bud going that way, a bud going that way. And that's how you build the framework up. You're going to get a flush of growth. You're going to get a crop of flowers from June until the end of October that's going to make your garden absolutely beautiful to be in. Looking over a rose garden in all the glory of the first flush of flowers with the changes in levels, it doesn't all happen by accident, you know. It needs care, it needs gardening, it needs a specific interest in the well-being of the plants. Take a standard rose, for instance. The staking, the tying in to ensure that there's no question of rock, no matter how big the canopy of flower, that the thing is firmly supported. And you would think that with all this, with feeding and pruning, nothing could happen to harm and mar the symmetry of the rose. But it does, on this rose in particular, I think it's got a specific weakness. The green fly feeding on the petals, distorting them. You've got to get rid of them or those roses are going to be spoiled. Behind the petals, the first signs, and that bud is better off, but the first signs of mildew, the whiteness behind the bud. And because I've broken that off, I prune it back. I don't want dye back, killing the whole shoot. Get it out of the way. And this rose seems absolutely to have got everything. Sawfly damage, where the 
whole of the tissue of the leaf has been rasped away, leaving just the veins, a skeletonized leaf. And that curse of so many roses, black spot, the typical symptoms, the fungi beginning to kill the green coloring matter of the leaf. Now, if that goes on long enough, you're going to defoliate your plant. But there's no need to despair because in one spray, you can clear the whole lot. And provided you get at them quickly enough, it's just as simple as that. A preventative spray, a spray when you see them like this, and then one other for the rest of the season, you're home and dry. And when a rose has got as many problems and pests and diseases as this, you look for the cause. And a brown discoloration to a leaf edge is a sure sign of potash deficiency, and potash is what gives the plant its resistance to disease. So look very carefully while you're growing your roses at the back to see if there's any of the typical rust clusters behind it, this orange pustulation behind. And if you find leaves like that with this browning of the leaf edge, that is potash deficiency. So what I'm going to do with that is give it an ounce to the square yard of potash well watered in so it gets it. And that should put its troubles right, just a little dose of medicine. One of the things that happens with roses is the soil seems to tend to sink a little, to go down. And it leaves your crown, this part, exposed above the soil surface. So I mulch up. And the best mulch is compost, if you can make it, or a bit of good, honest muck. <laughs> I'm a music. No smell, it's been kept over here. Wouldn't matter if there was, the smell makes them grow a little bit more. Now I'm never frightened of getting my hands dirty. That does three things. It keeps your soil in first class physical condition. It holds moisture. And it keeps the crown of the rose where it should be. All gardeners have idiosyncrasies when they've been growing a particular flower for a long time. And I have one particularly about roses, and that's in the matter of crown buds. I always maintain that they want to be out of the way. Look at the length of stalk there, compared to the length of stalk there. You've got a modest three inches there, useless. You've got 18 inches with that one, which holds the rose up and shows it to you. What's good of a rose that's hidden down amongst the bushes? And also, it depresses the growth on these. So I just nip them out like that. I often wonder what roses would say if they could talk, some of the ways we treat them. And to get big, powerful buds like that, great, strong, beautifully formed hybrid tea roses, you've got to disbud. And you've got to do it early. Take the little side buds out, do it very gently. There's nothing more harassing to a rose grow than to be disbudding and take them all off. And it's very easy to do it. Now that rose will develop free from the depressing effect of the crown bud and they'll all open together. And once the first flush of flowers is finished, I give them another two ounces to the square yard of fertilizer to get them into the second growth. Keep feeding them. Don't feed them four ounces all at once in the early part of the year. It's like giving a man three Sunday dinners at half-hour intervals. He can't use it. And half of it goes shoot straight down the drainage hole into the river. And fertilizer is an expensive way of keeping the water level up in the river. And fed like that with balanced fertilizer, these roses will go on not for just one year, not for 10 years, but for 20 years. And then being a Yorkshireman, I take cuttings. Once the flowers fade, that wood is ripe enough for cutting. Pull it off with a heel, dip them in a rooting hormone, have a little ribbon border in front of the bed with sand, pop them in there, you've got roses on their own roots. The great thing about taking cuttings is make a hole deep enough, make sure your cutting is pushed right down so there's no cavity underneath to fill with stagnant air, stagnant moisture, and then firm it and keep on firming it and checking it. 
But like me, you'll get bored and you'll want the new varieties and you'll go to a nurseryman and you'll look at your roses and you'll choose them for the power of the wood. Then right through, you'll get flowers like that. And on a June evening, there's no place better to sit in quietly and enjoy your garden than with roses. One of the problems you've got with most gardens is an area of concrete or an area of flagstones in front of the house. To me, it's no problem. It gives you a chance to enjoy the pleasure you can get out of growing things in tubs. This is the way you can change the character of a garden almost overnight, by having wallflower tulips in the spring, by having ivy leaved pelargoniums and fuchsias, lovely little shrubs, in the summer. And I'm intrigued. One of the questions I've asked myself on several occasions is, what is best for a tub? Do you want something brightly colored that pulls the eye in? Or do you want something pastel shaded that softens the aridity of the concrete? So I'm going to do one in pastel shaded colors, which I'm sure in my own mind is going to be the nicest. And I'm going to do the other in much stronger, brighter colors. And they're just odds and ends that you can buy at any garden shop or that you can keep going. Because one of the beauties about these particular pelargoniums and the ivy leaves and the fuchsias is that you can keep them going from cuttings year after year. And your petunias and your labelia, all you need is a 10p packet of seed and a half a beer barrel. What'll it cost you? A pound, possibly, and a coat of paint, and with care and preservation, it'll give you 20 years of wear and tear. Drill four holes in the bottom, because I know a beer barrel's made to hold beer, but you don't want your plants sitting in a waterlogged condition. And then cover the drainage holes, the four of them, with a piece of crock like that. That's to ensure that your fine mixture you're going to put in to grow the plants in doesn't wash down and clog the drainage channels. You break your crocks up on a wet day when there's nothing else to do in the garden, as if that never happened. And then, some well-rotted manure, or pot roughage, anything that can go on top, because that area at the bottom, it's going to be a long time before your plant roots are down into that. And the only thing that ensures that a container like this doesn't become stagnant and anaerobic, airless, is the fact that the plant roots are exploring it, or that the excess moisture is going quickly away. And you don't want too rich a compost to grow your annuals in, because if they burgeon up, you get all foliage and no flowers. And who wants foliage when you can have brilliant flower colors? So a bit of soil riddled out of the garden. If you're gardening properly, then it's in good enough condition. Fill it about half full, and then just use the back of your spade. Firm it, but don't overcompact it. Then complete the process, and you don't want to firm the top half of it. And you don't want to fill it right up to the tub edge. Because there must be room. Remember that in the initial stages, these will need copious waterings to keep them going. There's a great fat, juicy earthworm there. Well, he won't really be any good in the tub, and I think he'd be happier in the open garden. Level it off. Now, this is going back against the wall, which means I'll be seeing it from that area only, so I'm going to keep the high stuff at the back. And the fuchsia. I have a penchant for fuchsias, possibly because they're easy to grow. They have pretty flowers, and they flower with a little attention for months. And once you've got them, you can keep them going forever. And conditions in the tub are so good, you needn't be vastly particular about how you put them in. The roots are put in intact, and they soon strike away. Now, that's the high point. Everything I put in now must be subsidiary to that. And because the front of the tub tends to need masking, you've got an area of bareness there. 
couple of another favourite of mine, the ivy leaf pelagons. This is instant gardening, you know. You don't have to sit about and wait for the things to grow and flower. They're there already. And the lobelia to provide a foreground pattern, to fill in the, the groundwork, to throw the other colours into bolder relief. They're pretty without flies. I sometimes wish, to such an extent that I take the flowers off, that this one didn't flower, not initially because the flowers are pink. One of those at either side. That wouldn't really be quite right if I think about it. I haven't really planned this tub, it was just the things that I had in. Those would be better as a group planting in front of the fuchsia. And then I'm going to put some petunias that I had spare from the bedding round the edge. Because I want my bolder colours in close. Bring that one slightly forward to give you an additional line. And if I don't like it, when I've finished, I'm going to take them all up and do it again. Which is more than you can do in the garden proper or the neighbours start complaining. That's the basic pattern. Don't sit behind it and do it all at once. Have a walk round the front. That's not at all as a colour grouping. All I need is some more lobelia to fill in round. And lobelia's cheap enough. I've got the main body of the garden bedded out. And I've liked petunias ever since I was a child. I don't know whether it's the fact that the flowers are such a, a strange shape, this great flaring trumpet, or they're so brilliant, but... And look at that for a root system. That's well weaned and on solids, I think we might say. All the empty spaces, because don't forget that if you put one too many in, you can always take them out again later on. Make sure they're firm, so they stand up. I'm cheating a bit and using the ones in flower because I want to see a picture when I finish. And the pastel shaded, the blends of leaf and flower are what make the picture. I think two more should do it. There's a creative pleasure, I don't know what it is about gardening, of seeing pictures growing under your hands and knowing that you're creating the best possible conditions for your plants to grow in and that they're going to give you and anyone who comes along the path intense pleasure. Well, I don't know. I reckon that for effort expended is very, very well rewarded. In the other half of the barrel, which is in partial shade, I've used perella as a focal point. Large, dark purple leaf plants that lift the centre of the picture. And then in front of the perella, begonias. Now these I sowed in the greenhouse in March, and they're ready for planting out in the early part of June, and they thrive in partial shade. This is the beauty of them. But even then, in dry weather, you've got to keep them watered to keep them in flushed and active growth. And then to highlight the more intense colour of the begonia, cinerarias. Now it only grows 10 inches high, but the bright silver foliage makes the perfect foil to the brilliant colours of the begonia. And you don't have to restrict your planting to the popular summer bedding plants. You can grow dwarf shrubs like the conifers in containers of all shapes and sizes because this is where you get your variety, the infinite variety of shape in containers. And you can build up a whole series of landscapes in miniature. You can design them, perfect for people who haven't got a garden. Um...
marvelous little utility plants if you want to break up the hard edge of a path or soften the line where patio and garden meet. And they go out usually in the beginning of June. You don't want any frost on them, so wait until all fear of frost's gone. And you put them in about six, eight inches apart, and then you'll get a solid carpet of color right through the summer. And I like to nick the plants apart. Just use the edge of a trowel rather than ripping them or cutting them with a knife because you want as much of the root system intact as possible. So the plants establish. Immediately they're put into the open garden. You don't want any check to growth. You want this instant color. This is what summer's all about. And I reckon that's enough for the path edge because I want to use any plants I've got left to soften the hard line in a tub between the house and the garden. I've been maneuvering various color schemes here, trying to take the hard angle off the corner, but some of the colors are so exotic, I've got to keep going away and taking a rest. I only hope the effect on passers-by isn't quite as catastrophic, but what I'm after is to move the center, the focal point, off center and taper it down, yet still leaving the back high, which will take the hard angle off the corner. And to say the colors are extravagant, I think would be an understatement. But this will be suitable with some milder yellows in front. Lift them out of the way. With a tub, it's always better to start on the farthest point away. Grand rooted plants, it's a pleasure to get your fingers in soil when you're handling good material. Now that's a fuchsia called swing time. A good combination of colors, something that without taking the eye in too hard, will at least attract attention. Dress the plants up a bit as you put them in. Any dead leaves, take them off. It's much easier to do them when you've got them in your hand. I love the smell of geranium foliage too, or pelagoniums as they should be called. And then the marigolds, they're not the height of six pennies of copper, but look at the amount of color there. And you can poke those in wherever there's room. Fill it right in, the whole ground planting, right in with the bright yellow. So you come through red, through dark purple, to bright yellow. Then some verbena. Now, this has spreading growth, so it's useful as an edging plant for a tub piece there and some ground planting at the back good tap to settle them all in well if that doesn't do things for the garden nothing will <laughs> 